So this is about uh, machine learning and deep uh, neural networks, and I promised to do no math, but I actually lied. And you will find out in a minute or two. Okay, um, this is a visual introduction, so I have lots of graphics and online demonstrations. I hope they go, go well and smoothly. So first of all, what is machine learning? And I stole some slide from someone else who stole the idea. And the, uh, the, like the main thing of machine learning is the science of getting computers to act without being explicitly programmed. And on the left side here, you see how you would normally write a program. You get some rules from, I don't know, product owners, and you get some input to your program. You write some code, it outputs some, some stuff. That is regular programming. But in machine learning, you do it the other way around. So you get some input, like sample input and sample output. And with that, you train a machine to actually de derive some, some sort of rules or some sort of model for what it is supposed to do. And this is machine learning, so quite different. And the applications are very, like, like there's a lot of stuff you can do with it. First of all, maybe most interesting for us is, is uh, self-driving cars. And it's quite advanced, like surprisingly advanced. Every Tesla from now on will have very powerful device that enables is uh, to at least theoretically be self-driving. So very interesting. There's also medical stuff like ultrasound machines that can detect cancer. Um, in the Samsung M1 chip, you have branch detection by means of, of neural networks. So it's, it's actually a thing. Then this year, a machine beat one of the best Go players, uh, um, Lisa Dole. Uh, the machine called AlphaGo, also using machine learning. And then you can also use it to colorize your black and white pictures uh, of your ancestors, whatever. And there's lots of other things, for example, also completing scenes in movies. And you show the machine the beginning of a scene, and the machine predicts how it is going to uh, progress there. Like, are they going to hug, are they going to fight, whatever. So there's a lot of stuff, from very serious stuff to a lot of fun stuff. It's a thing. So um, I'm doing this in the browser, and why? Because the predominant uh, programming languages are Python and R, and even under the hood, they use something else that's much more performant. Most of the time, C or C++ or Fortran things. But still, JavaScript has its benefits, because um, you might be a JavaScript developer, and you're not familiar with Python or even R, or it might be the only language that's around when you deploy things, because you just have the browser, and it might be beneficial, for example, if you have game AI um, in a browser. Like, if you use Phaser or something, you might want to use game AI. The only thing you have at your hand is, is JavaScript. So that means it's a zero installation thing. It's everywhere. So you can make uh, machine learning run everywhere. And this is what we're going to do today uh, by combining the JavaScript with visualizations. But first of all, a very quick overview. There are a lot of machine learning JavaScript libraries. Um, we're going to through none of them today, but a different one, just maybe to later have a reference if you want to study more. There's a lot of very interesting stuff. But as I said, today we're going to look into deep neural networks and we're using in interactive visualizations. So what is like, the basics of, of all the neural network stuff? And it's actually a neuron, or better to say, a mathematical model of a neuron. And it doesn't matter much if you actually understand how a neuron in your brain works. It's just the inspiration for this like, artificial neuron. So it's, it's inspired, but it's not exactly the same in your brain. It doesn't matter. What actually matters is that the thing that we are going to look at has some very interesting mathematical properties. So how does it work? So on the that's your left side. On your left side, you see inputs, x1 to xn. And those inputs, they get multiplied by weights, uh, um, w1 to wn. And then, once that is done, they are summed up. It's very simple. It's like a very simple operation. And then they're fed through an activation function. And that is a neuron. Done. Um, and the whole thing creates one single output, and you can do other stuff with that output. Uh, 
we are JavaScript developers, I guess. So I implemented something exactly like this in JavaScript. And it's, it's stunningly simple. It's, it's almost stupid. I mean, in box two, you see the complete simulation of, of a perceptron. It's naive. You probably won't do it like in a real world thing, but just to show you the point. And you get some inputs, in our case, just two, x1, x2. And you have some weights in the upper box. And uh, you have weight one and weight two, and you multiply x1 with weight one, and you multiply x2 with weight two. But there's still an additional thing, which is called bias or constant, which is uh, w0. Um, this is just adding a constant. And if you're familiar with mathematics, you see this is actually an equation for a line. If you like change it a little bit uh, and reformulate it, you will very easily see this is, this is the equation for a line. So it can draw a line. But then it goes through an activation function. In uh, the second box, it's called uh, in line three. And that activation function could be several of, of some. But in our case, it's a sigmoid function. And the sigmoid function is displayed on, on your right here. Looks like this. All the activation functions sort of look like this. They look like a step function, sometimes a little bit smooth, sometimes not. Sometimes they are linear. But you typically have something that adds a little bit of non-linearity to the whole thing to make, to make it a little bit interesting. Uh, <coughs> so what can you do with this? I mean, what is it good for? Um, if you represent your logical functions, like basic functions like not, or, um, what have we, NAND, if you present them to be points on a plane, like I did here. So in the upper right, this is true and true, and this is true, and the others, they are all false. Um, if, you, if you put your, like your, your results of the logical function in the plane like this, you can um, think of a neuron being able to separate those two, um, two, two sets of, of of results. And it can do it by line, right? I mean, you just draw a line between the false things and the, uh, the true things. And if that is at all possible, uh, a function is called linear, uh, linearly separable. I'm going to run this because I have it prepared. And this is exactly what you saw on the slide. But this time, you see interactive learning. So the green thing, obviously, is the, is the line. And it tries to learn how to put the line, how to put the slope, how to put the offset, so it actually separates um, uh, both classes. And at this point, you see how, how accurate it is. And actually, now reach accru accuracy one, and it can stop at this point. So it learned this by using a single neuron. And this now is the, the slope, which is negative, and this is the offset. And it learned it for this, for this line. So it's just a line. It's not very powerful, it's just a line. So no deep magic, it's, it's, at its core, it's a line. So what can it not do? Um, I told you it can do and, and if you represent all like and, it can actually like, learn the or as well. But it, what, what it cannot do is it cannot learn x or, and it cannot do it because there's no way to like, position a single line so it actually um, separates the true uh, values from the false values. Those are the false ones, and the, those are the true ones. So that's not possible with a single line, unless you sort of represent the things differently. But this would involve some, some manual fiddling. But typically, you can't solve XOR, which is a very basic thing already. So that means a single neuron is sort of powerful, but not very powerful. How can you learn something like a self-driving car with that? And I mean, how is that possible? And what you do is you combine them. You combine those neurons into, um, into sets of neurons and create networks from that. And what I'm going to uh, show you here, what I'm using to, to make the point clear, is the so-called TensorFlow playground. Something very, very nice. It's done by Google. Um, you can just reach it over the link. I have it here. Um, what you can do, you can play around with, with the networks and then configure them and try them out. Um, and the sample that I'm using here is a classification example. So what we have, we have uh, dots 
those things here. We have orange dots, we have blue dots, and they are put on a plane in a certain pattern. And that pattern is to be learned by a neural network, and the reason for that is it should predict values that it has not seen before. That's the whole, that's the whole point. I mean, you give, them, you give a network some points, train it with it, and the, the goal is to make predictions for points you have not seen before. And the predictions that you're seeing here, that is already the result, they're not like binary, one or two, or I don't know, minus one or one, but they're continuous in a way that if something is really very, very uh, orangey, the network is, is, is very sure it's the, the point that is going to appear here is, is orange. If it's very bluey, it's, it's blue, but there's stuff in between, especially at this fringe here. Okay, um, how are we going to do this? So this is, this is our task. Um, but first of all, maybe why is that at all important? I mean, why would you be interested in, in separating blue dots from, from orange dots? Probably you're not, but you might be interested in something else. So classification is a very common thing. Um, for example, you might ask a car, is, it, is this a situation where I should brake? Or does this look like some sort of cancer? Or should this pixel in, in that uh, black and white picture actually be blue? Or looking at credit card transaction, does that look like a fraud transaction or not? Or then in that Samsung processor, it's again a classification. Is this code going to be branching here or not? This is all like classification. Like most examples that you see are classification. There are others like regression, but most of the time you see classification. Well, this is just a sample for it, I mean, but it, it, it follows the same, the same rules. So, um, I'm going to start this in a second, but first, some very brief introduction. As I said, we are arranging neurons or perceptrons, however you may call them, in layers. That's a, that's a whole trick. So we're not having one of them, but a lot. So the first layer typically is input. And in our case, that is very, very simple because we're just piping things through. We have an input layer that takes in the x and y coordinate of the whole thing, of, of each point also. Uh, but we're doing nothing to it. We could do something here. We can pre-process it. We can like square it or multiply them with each other, which would actually change what we can predict with them. But we're not doing it here. Um, we're just taking them like literally. And then, um, each typical network has at least one middle layer, and that middle layer is called hidden layer. There might be more, like one layer, but in this case, we just have uh, one layer. And uh, this layer contains three neurons, obviously. Each of those boxes is a neuron. <coughs> and it's exactly the thing, the thing that I've shown you before. So each neuron is, is that what I described a little bit earlier in JavaScript. And the implementation of this thing is actually very, very close to what I did by hand. So it's, it's really this thing. And what it does, I mean, you see each of them, it can produce a line. You see that? Line, line, line. And then eventually, they're giving an output, and this output is combined in the last layer, which is not represented here, but it's still there. It's a single additional neuron. It's combined by this uh, additional neuron. It takes all three inputs as x1, x2, x3, uh, multiplies them with its own learned weight, and puts it through a, a, a hyperbolic uh, tangent function, and it creates this output. And this is also intuitive that actually three of those neurons can, can fix the problem, because each of those neurons, if you look closely at them, they contribute um, to a triangle. So you put them together and you have a triangle, and this is okay to solve the problem here, like to separate the blue ones from the orange ones. So three neurons is actually a good solution for this. Um, as I said, this thing is learned. It's not that I, by hand, tweak the values I could have. It's possible. For a network of that size, it's totally possible to actually do it by hand, but you don't do this. Instead, you train the whole thing, and you do it by uh, pushing through test points, or better say training points, and you see how accurate is the prediction, and the error that you get 
Uh, with that, you change the weights in the network. And mathematically, this is, this is a well-known optimization problem, and it's often solved by stochastic gradient descent. If you don't know what that is, it doesn't matter. You just use it. I mean, uh, mathematic, ma mathematicians have solved that for you, fortunately. Um, so you actually don't need to understand the math at this point. Um, good thing for us. So let's run it. Introduce the basics. It does work. Maybe it's a little bit too small. And I hope... Is it okay? Good? Yeah. And I hope you understand most of it already because I showed it in the slides. And this is exactly the example that I just showed you, right? And <coughs> by now, on that right side here, you see that... Would you even call it a prediction? There's just nothing. So the prediction that it does, it's just... It's random. And you also uh, see the randomness not only in this graphic here, but also in those two values up here. There's something called training loss, and that means how good are we doing? I mean, with the points that we use to train this, this whole network, how good are we in predicting uh, the, right, the right points? And, and um, 0 0.5 would have been random guessing, and we are even worse than random guessing. We are 0 0.53, because this is, this is just a random value. So I'm going to begin to train it. I see it wiggling around, but it's very, very, very uh, fast in actually finding a very good value. And while it is doing it, on, again on the upper uh, right, you see a graph going down. I can stop it now because it's already very, very good at predicting. And uh, the loss is less than, I don't know, less than 1%. Is that true? It's less than 0.1%. I think it, it's very good, at least. And you see, you see it in the graph going down. I'm going to do it again and ask you to watch those two graphs uh, closely. As I said, there are two graphs, and they're not quite in sync, right? You see that? That's quite normal, but at the end, they're quite in sync. So why are there two graphs? It's because the, the, the known set of data I have a known set of data where I know, okay, this point is supposed to be blue. Make the right prediction. I split it in half in this case. Typically, you split it 60-40. Some people say 80-20, but I split it in half using this thing here. And only half of the points I use actually for training. And the other half I use to test how well has the network been trained. Because the whole idea of the thing is that I can later predict points that I have not seen before. And if if it is very good at the point that I trained it with, but very bad with things it has not seen before, it's not a good result. So we typically have uh, two sets, and we have two training... Um, uh, sorry, we have two, um, two measures for how well the network is performing. And if the curve looks like this, it's all good. We did the right thing. We did well, very well with the training thing, but we also did very well with the test data. Good stuff. Uh, you can also like hover over the thing, and then you see what each neuron contributes to the whole thing. Very nice to actually try that out. We can remove one of those neurons, and I think you already have an intuition that that might not be enough, because we now need to combine two, uh, two lines to make a separation. I think this is not going to work well, right? And it does some stuff, it does this, and then you see both values are very bad already, so there's no way to separate the whole thing with, with two neurons. No way. And typically you have to try that out, but we're going to uh, come to this in, in a minute. I'm also running a little bit out of time, so let's go ahead a little bit. I told you this uh, already, but this is a very important thing about training. Again, I told you, if uh, those two lines, they go down in the same way eventually. This is a good thing. But I actually created a case where the whole thing here looks very much more complicated. And the gray line, which is much better, is the training loss. And what I achieved there, that actually for the training data, it did okay, like 20% wrong. But uh, it 
it did something that's called overfitting. That means it's too specific to the training data. So it's not performing well on, on data that it has not seen before. So this is a very bad training result. This is to be avoided. But this is probably like the most complicated thing about all this. So why am I talking about deep neural networks? Um, it is mathematically provable that uh, you can solve each function with a single hidden layer. But there's no way or no efficient way uh, to train such a large single hidden layer. So what people do in practice is they create multiple hidden layers and that again makes it possible to train them effectively. And uh, click on the links if you really want to know why. And this is the way it would look like. First hidden layer, second, and you see the results here are already interesting, and then they get more interesting, and you see eventually you get something that almost looks like a circle here. So the result is much better. But it could have been achieved with a single layer. But typically you don't do that. You split it up into many layers um, to make stuff more efficient and actually practical, uh, feasible. So that's, that's it more or less, surprisingly enough. And the challenge in this is to decide, like the meter parameters, how many layers, how many neurons, which activation functions, how should you learn? Um, and this is actually the tough part. And you either try it out, but typically not by hand, but using something called a grid search, a search over those parameters, and try, try out all those parameters. And you, use, you need a lot of uh, computation power for that. You probably need, need some Amazon stuff where you have GPUs and stuff. So the alternative is that you use a pre-trained network. So someone else did it already for you and gives you the pre-trained network, which is also possible. Which brings us to the last part of the talk. And uh, this is about probably the most interesting part of, of uh, neural networks. And this is convolutional networks. And those are special networks um, that are optimized to process images. And they are um, pre-trained networks and I'm using, I'm showing one trained by Google, and Google spent probably millions of dollars training this network, and it gives it to us for free, which is a nice thing, so I use it. Um, this is actually the layout of layers that they are using for their network, and this is really deep. I mean, you read it from this to this, right? No, other way around, from this to that. This is input, and it goes through this stuff, um, this is really a deep network, and it's not even like the biggest. You can have, I, I haven't counted, but you can easily have networks with more than 100 layers. And each color represents a specific kind of, uh, of, of uh, layer, so they're different um, types. One relocates things so to make it um, location invariant, others do filtering, um, and they actually found this architecture to be like the best for what they, they have in mind. And training this thing is super expensive. Running it is also very expensive, it drains your battery, but training it is, is much more expensive. So uh, what does it do? And I can only give an intuition because I said I spare you the math. Let's say you want to detect if, if a picture contains a dog or not, and those are your training images. An internal presentation of a thing like take this with a grain of salt, sort of looks like this. So it's location invariant, so it doesn't matter if the dog is small on the left side or on the right side, and it sort of finds something that a dog has some, uh, some eyes and has a snout. And we also have to say that all these dogs look pretty similar, so this representation would look a little bit different if you have a pug in there or, I don't know, something else. So this is just the intuition. This is what the, what the network does with those pictures. Find an abstraction, but automatically. You just feed in the pictures. And uh, my final example, <laughs> I actually had this as, as a capture. I was very surprised, and other people had that as well. Um, and it's to tell the dog from the muffin. It's super hard. I mean, this thing, I wasn't quite sure. I'm still not quite sure. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I took this, this shibaba. I had no idea it's a shibaba. Yeah, it just and I put it in this, in this thing provided by Google, and it tells me with 
certain teeth, this is a shiraba. So it gets it done. And then the other thing is a Pomeranian, which I think also is a dog. So it, so it did better than me in that case. It was pre-trained. It runs on my machine, it runs on your machine. You can, you can just download it. Eventually, I, I fed in a picture of myself, and with 10%, it, it says I'm wearing a wig, which is a perücke in German. Uh, <laughs> so it found out about my dirty secret. Uh, so this is what you can do with that stuff on your machine. And with that, I'm exactly out of time. I say thank you. And if you're afraid of the singularity, like the super brain artificial <laughs> machine, uh, look at this stuff. This is, this is the state of the art in robotics. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot.